Wasn't that simply beautiful? Well, that's a Thank you, choir. Thank you, orchestra. Thank you, Malcolm, for that beautiful solo. And thank you all for being here this day. It was King David who wrote the memorable verse which proclaimed, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. He wrote that 122nd Psalm for pilgrims on their way to worship. And so it becomes our song of praise as we gather together in spirit and in truth on God's Sabbath day to worship. And so I greet you this day in the name of God our Father, Christ our Savior, and in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, our comforter, our counselor, and our guide. It is so good that you have joined us for worship today whether you're online, wherever you may be in the world, we welcome you. And for those of you who are in the beautiful sanctuary here, the Woodlands Methodist Church, we're delighted that you are here. This Sunday, we continue our invitation sermon series, focusing on today the power of one. The power of one. In the next few minutes, I'm going to do my best to make a case to make a case that would have you rethinking the unbelievable influence that is rooted and lodged within each one of us. We may not realize it, but we all possess the ability to sway, to inspire, to persuade, or to win others over to a cause simply by what we say or how we act. Stories abound of how one person can change or alter another person's life. And for many of us, that, that claim is not far-fetched because somewhere along the way, there is a high probability that someone changed or altered the course of your life simply through the power of their influence upon you. And so that's what we're talking about today. But before we get into that, won't you pray with me? I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer, drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Amen. It all began with an innocent observation that was overheard by two disciples who were followers of the great forerunner of Jesus, John the Baptist. As John stood speaking one day, this prophet from Galilee simply passed by. And John the Baptist pointed out to him, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Most scholars will agree that this scene took place after John's baptism of Jesus and after Jesus had returned from his temptations in the wilderness. He said it every time he saw Jesus because it was important for him in naming Jesus as the Son of God. John the Baptist speaks with unclouded vision. He means nothing less than the full Christian doctrine that the man Jesus is the eternal Son of the eternal Father co-equal, co-eternal. 
And it's important for us to note that John the Baptist's role is emphasized as a witness, not primarily as a baptizer, but a witness. Witnesses give testimony to what they have seen and what they have experienced in an effort to establish the truth. John the Baptist was a reliable witness and he knew who Jesus was because of what he saw with his own eyes and what he heard with his own ears. In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you recall when John baptized Jesus, the, heaven, the Holy Spirit descended a, upon him and the voice of God itself spoke and John was there. He saw, he heard, he knew who Jesus was. Behold the Lamb of God. Now one of the disciples who overheard the remark was Andrew. The other is unnamed in this gospel, but it's believed to be the writer of the gospel itself. So as soon as Jesus passes by, the two of them began to follow him. Now, now, this is when you get a chance to use your imagination because uh, it doesn't take much for us to visualize two strangers following someone they don't even know. Can't you just picture this scene? When, when Jesus stops, they stop. When Jesus looks around to see who's following him, they look around as to not to be so obvious. They are stalking Jesus. Here we have the first New Testament uh, occurrence of someone stalking Jesus as if he didn't know they were following him. You don't sneak up on Jesus. <laughs> you don't do that. <laughs> so so as, as they follow him, finally, Jesus, knowing that he was being followed, turned to them and asked, what? are you seeking? What are you seeking? Now, before we get too far into this narrative, let me just pause here and share with you the importance of that, of that question. You see, it's no accident or coincidence that some of the first words that Jesus spoke in his role as the identified Messiah, as the Son of God. Before we get too far into this, this, this profoundly significant question is, what are you seeking? What are you looking for? Here we are just 38 verses into the first chapter, and Jesus utters this question. He was probing them to find out whether they were motivated by idle curiosity or by a real desire to know who he was. And the reason why I want to pause here, because I want to say to you that the same question that, that Jesus ask those two disciples is the same question that he's asking of us on this fourth Sunday in August 2022, what, what are we seeking? What are we looking for? He put that question to them and he puts it to us today and he asks it in every rim and every scope of our lives. In your daily living, what are you looking for? In your private life, what are you seeking? in our dealings with others. What? Now, would it surprise you that so many in this time, in this day and age would respond by saying, I don't know. I don't know what it is I'm looking for. With regards to the church, I would be so bold to say that there are many people who are driven by curiosity when it comes to this thing called faith, when it comes to this thing called church. 
You see, they are inquisitive about how seemingly intelligent people like us, I'm, I'm assuming we're all, uh, when it comes to intelligent people, how we can put our trust, our hope, our confidence, even our fears and our disappointments in two of the hands of a God that we have never seen or Jesus that they have never met. How can we do that? They, they, they stand on the fringes of life, looking at us, wondering, what, what do they do here at 8.30 and 11.15 on Sunday? Why are they here? And they look from the outside, inside, wondering whether or not they should commit themselves to a cause that makes no sense to the modern world. And the answer that I would give to the curious is the same answer that Jesus gave to those two disciples when they asked him about himself. He said, come and see. You really want to know more about me? Come and see. And whether you believe it or not, that's the only way that we're going to be able to answer the questions of a curious world, the question of what we are looking for or what we're seeking. The answer can only come by way of this one man named Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I love John's gospel. And if you flip a few pages beyond this particular first chapter, you get to the 12th chapter, and there's this beautiful story of how certain Greeks, Greeks were supposed to have the intelligence of the old world, the, how Greeks had heard about this Savior from other people, and impressed by what they heard, they desired to spend some time with him. And so at a festival in this 12th chapter of the Gospel of John, they find Philip. And they say to Philip that they want to spend some time with Jesus. And this is how they phrase it. I love it. They said, Sir, we would see Jesus. Wouldn't we all? <laughs> Sir, we would see Jesus. I bring that to your attention because in the year 1852, a very gifted author and songwriter by the name of Anna Bartlett Warner wrote a hymn based on that scripture, We Would See Jesus. And she called it, We Would See Jesus. The words are so appropriate for what it is we're looking for. Listen to what she writes. We would see Jesus for the shadows lengthen across this little landscape of our life. We would see Jesus, our weak faith to strengthen for the last weariness, the final strife. We would see Jesus. This is all we're needing. Strength, joy, and willingness come with the sight. We would see Jesus dying, risen, pleading, then welcome day and farewell to mortal light. Are we simply curious? Or do we really want to know who Jesus really is? Those two disciples sought to know who he was and as my good friend from Oklahoma, didn't even meet him, but he's my good friend, Paul Harvey would say, you know the rest of this story. It's borne out in Scripture. It says they stayed with him all day. And if you get curious about this, and about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Andrew ran and found his brother, Simon. Why would the gospel writer put four o'clock in the afternoon? Well, 
my way of thinking is this is that when you discover Jesus, when you find out who he really is, that hour, that day, where you are or where you were is etched forever in your mind because that's the moment that life takes on all fullness. It was four o'clock in the afternoon when Andrew discovered Jesus. And he ran to his brother. And when he found him, he said, we have found the Messiah. Simon went to see for himself. And upon meeting Jesus, was given the name of Cephas, which translates into Peter, which later became for us the rock. The very next day, Jesus found Philip. And then Philip found Nathaniel, and the rest is history. You see, my brothers and sisters, every page of this remarkable story has the signature of how one person had the power to influence another person, and then another person, and then another. It all began with this declaration that was overheard by two disciples. Behold the Lamb of God. And it started a chain of events that resulted in the greatest movement the world has ever known. The power of one. That same power resides in us. We all have the ability to bring others to Jesus. But let me give you now the, 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 the meaning of this sermon, the, the climax of this sermon. Because when you go home, they're going to say, what did the preacher talk about today? Well, you give them this sentence here because this is what the preacher talked about today. The only requirement for us to be successful in bringing others to Jesus is this, you have to know Jesus for yourself. <laughs> That's it. That's what you tell them when you get home, okay? You have to know Jesus for yourself. You cannot introduce someone to someone you don't know. You can't witness to something that you have never seen. <laughs> That's the requirement. When a person joins our church, and we're delighted to welcome new members all the time, we really only ask one question that has several parts to it. But let me tell you what we ask new members. We say, will you be loyal to the church and uphold it with your prayers your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witnesses. Five parts there. Now, time will not allow me to elaborate on, on those points because they speak for themselves. But, but quickly, when we say, will you, will you be loyal with your prayers? The least we can do is pray for the church. When it says your presence, we, we would hope that you would come as often as you can. When it says your gifts, it simply means that we would like for you to be a good steward with your giving of your tithes and your, and your gifts. When it says your service, it simply means would you be willing to be engaged in the work of missions and ministry in the church? That's what this Sunday, Get in the Game, is all about. When you go down that hallway, you'll see the, the myriad of ways that you can get involved in the church through your service. You saw the video. It's happening every day here at the church, your service. But did you hear that last charge? You witness. Your witness. Will you be a faithful witness to the church and invite others to come and see for themselves the work of God's kingdom right here at 2200 Lake Woodlands Drive? You know, a lot of people think that they have to be an evangelist to bring someone else to Jesus. You don't have to be an evangelist. 
You don't have to have this speech. Just be a witness to what you've seen and what you've heard here. That's all you need to do. And, and you can do that through your living, through your conversation. The name Edward Kimball may not ring a bell to most of you, but in 1854, Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher in Detroit. And one day he decided to visit a 17-year-old boy who was in his Sunday school class, but who Kimball knew had little interest in God or religion. The, 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 the little boy was just there, curious. And so he went to pay a call to him. He even went to the place where the boy worked, his job in a shoe store. And while in Holston's shoe store, he brought this young man into a relationship with Jesus Christ. That man's, that young boy's name was Dwight L. Moody, who went on to become one of the greatest evangelists in the world. There is even a marker at the spot of his conversion at that Holston's shoe store, the day that he got converted. Talking about remembering the day, the time, the place when Jesus stepped into your life. There, there it is at that shoe store. But it doesn't stop there. Dwight Moody was a strong influence on a man by the name of Frederick B. Meyer, a great English theologian. Meyer came to the United States to preach, and he met and encouraged a young minister by the name of Wilbur Chapman, who also became one of America's great evangelists. Chapman chose as his associate a young professional baseball player named Billy Sunday, who also became a great evangelist. And Billy Sunday was preaching one day in Charlotte, North Carolina. And from that revival, a prayer group was formed that met regularly to pray for revival. And, and their specific prayer was that another revival would happen in Charlotte that would have the power of the Billy Sunday revivals. And in an answer to their prayers, a man by the name of Mordecai Ham came to preach, and he preached so eloquently that in that revival meeting, a young man gave his life to Christ whose name was Billy Graham. And it goes on, it goes from Kimball to Moody to Meyer to Chapman to Billy Sunday to Mordecai Ham, to Billy Graham, and on down the line. Oh, my brothers and sisters, the faith that we cling to has been given to us, handed down to us through the power of one person touching another, and then another, and then another, and it has reached us and given us the answer to what we are seeking. And the answer is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And that's why you are here. Because somebody altered and changed your life and made you believe that he could do something for you. I truly believe it with all my heart that what God desires most from us is to use this power to convince others to come and see for themselves just what Jesus can do for them. Because as the song goes, if he's done it for me, I know that he can do it for you. Let me close with this true, wonderful story. Of a, it involves a painting. It's called Christ Before Pilate. Many of you may have seen that. It was done by a Hungarian painter, Mukowski. And, and you see it. You saw 
Pilate in his white robe and Jesus in his white robe and all the crowd surrounding him. I'll get back to that picture in just a moment, but the story goes that many years ago, the painting was on exhibition in Hamilton, Ontario. And one day, a sailor from one of the lake boats confronted, accosted the woman who was the attendant at the door with this blunt question, is Christ here? How much is it to see Christ? And when the attendant told the admission fee and what it was, he growled out, well, I, I suppose I have to pay it. And putting down a few coins, he swaggered into the room where the picture was being displayed. He sat down in front of the masterpiece to look at it. And I've asked the media to just hold that there, let you look at it. He sat down in front of it and he studied it for a moment or two. Then he took off his hat. He gazed upon the picture a little longer, this time more intently. And leaning down, he picked up the descriptive catalog, the pamphlet which he got at the door, which he dropped when he took his seat. He read the pamphlet and he studied the picture anew. And you could see that he visually dropped his face into his hands at intervals. And he remained in front of that picture for over an hour. And when the hardened sailor came out, there were tears running down his eyes and su suppressed sobs in his voice. And he said to the attendant, Madam, I came here to see Christ because my mother asked me to. I'm a rough seafaring man who makes his living on the lakes. And before I went on this cruise, I, my mother wanted me to see this picture and I promised her that I would and I came just to please her. I never believed in any such thing. But the man who could paint a picture like that. He must have believed in it. And so if he believes in it, there is something in me that makes me want to believe in it too. So madam, with God's help, I am a changed man from this day forward. And so I ask you, if a treasured painting can so appeal to the conscience of a wayward man who does not believe, what then can a vision of Jesus inspired by the Holy Spirit accomplish for those of us who sincerely seek an introduction to really come and see and find out for ourselves about him. Oh, we are the power of one. And if we show the world by our actions and by the words we use that we know him and believe in him, then maybe there's some hope for this dark world because maybe the world will accept the invitation for themselves to come and see. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. I see him in you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.